On? Is it on? Yeah. Okay. Um, I have my uh, sermon here, and then I have I have the uh, the computer is on my phone, so so I can uh, I I can change it from here. So there you go. So I'll be that's what I'm doing when I'm on my phone. I'm not like also texting. <laughs> okay. Um, so. Uh, um, I don't mind doing these things um, when it comes to having to do like a message with you guys. Uh, the uncomfortable part is that I feel like I'm, I'm preaching to the choir a little bit, that there's a distinct possibility that anything I'm saying you guys pretty much already know, um, or at least basically know. Uh, so I'm going off of the quotes, you can know a little bit about a lot of things or a lot about a few things. So today's thing is, I hope to <coughs> deepen something you already probably uh, know a little bit more about as you go through life anyway. And I'm gonna be reading the whole thing, which isn't quite as cool as if I was up here just talking because I know everything and I can't, I can't do that. <laughs> All right, so my topic today is um, stubbornness versus persistence. <clears throat> Um, I thought about it. Alan asked me if I could um, maybe do it, and I'm like, I mean, I don't mind doing it. I don't have anything that's rattling around in my head that I'm like, oh, that'd be cool to like do a message on or talk on for one of those um, journeys or anything like that. Nothing bouncing around. So I thought about it, and um, a couple years ago, I was part of a conversation at VBS that led to a discussion on free will and God's decision to give it to us. And I can't say that I've ever spent time contemplating free will. Um, what got me was that we have free will and God thought, you know what, let's make life extra salty and add stubbornness to the mix. I mean, this is a, this is a thing that has followed me most of my life because I started out extremely stubborn. I would say I was even obstinate in my stubbornness um, my six-year-old self would refuse to eat this or wear that or even refuse to forgive my siblings for the smallest thing. Um, I'd know I was wrong and I would loudly proclaim I was right. <clears throat> even one time in um, third grade, mom tried to help me edit one of my papers for school and eh, I was right. I mean, I knew I was wrong, <laughs> but it was my paper and that's fine that I got a D on it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that got me. Um, once I planned a road trip with friends fresh out of high school and uh, we all came down with the stomach flu. Both ends stomach flu. Did that stop me from being like, no, this is happening. I planned this, this is what's happening, we're gonna go and this is gonna happen. And we went and that is, that was terrible. We should not have gone. <laughs> um, uh, so I was told I was stubborn all my life and I claimed it and it was a prominent character trait. And then I got married. And you know what you should avoid being when you are married? You should avoid being stubborn. Uh, you do not want to win everything in your relationship if you want harmony. You don't want to dig your heels in on every little thing. I mean, it does teach your husband patience, so there's a little silver lining there for that. Um, Anyway, uh, so there's a story that I came across when I was, find, when I was looking uh, up stuff for this. And it goes, um, this is a true story, by the way. There's a place between two farms near Valley View, Alberta. Um, you will find two parallel fences running only two feet apart for about a half a mile. Why are there two fences when only one would do? Well, two farmers, Paul and Oscar, had a disagreement that erupted into a long-standing feud. Paul wanted to build a fence between their land and split the cost, but Oscar was unwilling to contribute. Since he wanted to keep cattle on his land, Paul went ahead and built the fence anyway. And after the fence was completed, Oscar said to Paul, oh, I see we have a fence. What do you mean we, Paul replied. I got the property line surveyed and built the fence two feet into my land. That means some of my land is outside the fence. And if any of your cows set foot on my land, I will shoot it. 
Oscar knew Paul was not joking, so when he eventually decided to use the land adjoining Paul's for pasture, he was forced to build another fence two feet away. Oscar and Paul are both now gone, but their double fence stands as an unfortunate monument to the high price we pay for stubbornness. So, you see what I mean? Seriously, what was God thinking? He just made his job harder, and not to mention our lives harder. In Exodus 33, 5, he said to Moses, Tell the Israelites, you are stiff-necked people. If I were going to go among you, even for a minute, I might destroy you. Even, it looks like even God struggled, struggles with how obnoxious stubbornness is. <clears throat> but his plan does usually have a purpose. So I'm going to try to unpack some of the options and maybe insights that may, might help us more stiff-necked people. First, stubbornness. Stubbornness, an adjective, having, to, having or showing dogged determination not to change one's attitude or position on something, especially in spite of good arguments or reasons to do so. A stubborn, stubborn refusal to learn from experience. Obstinate, stubborn as a mule, mulish, headstrong, willful, strong-willed, self-willed, pig-headed, bull-headed, all these things. Um, stubbornness is a result of someone who is determined not to change their attitude, opinion, nor their position. Angry, stubborn people are defensive, unteachable, and refuse to take correction. You would even say they were obstinate, obstinately selfish. <clears throat> Being stubborn isn't always horrible. Um, the terrible thing the bad thing is when it's displayed as childish behavior. Stubborn children are not flexible or manageable or teachable. They won't bend, nor do they budge. They insist on making their point, and even when they are wrong, they will never admit it. They're visibly angry and frustrated and impatient when other tries to pr others try to persuade them to do something they don't agree with. Sound familiar? <laughs> Um, the Jews are notoriously stubborn, and yet they are God's chosen people. There is, a story, there is story after story of God's frustration with their stubbornness, and rules and laws with how to curb and punish those who succumb to it. But they're God's chosen people, so there has to be a reason for him being like, yes, the, I, I want them to have this attitude. We just have to refine it in some way. <clears throat> There's a quote that says, stubbornly clinging to one's opinion is the best proof of stupidity. As a stubborn person, I don't like that. That's, that's not going to work for me. So then there's a, there's a verse in the Bible, Proverbs 15.32, that says, he who refuses correction despises his own soul, but he who listens to reproof gets understanding. That's more my style. It's got a plan of action that I can work with. So... What gets me around the stubborn pride? What can we do with this ingrained character flaw? That's where the word persistence comes in. It is also an adjective that means continuing firmly or obstinately in a course of action in spite of difficulty or opposition. The synonyms are tenacious, preserving, persevering, sorry, determined, resolute, purposeful, single-minded, tireless, patient, diligent, untiring, unwavering, and relentless. So wait, how are those different? They kind of still sound like it's being stubborn. <clears throat> so I'm going to leave this one up here and say stubborn again so you can. Um, stubborn was having or showing dogged determination not to change one's attitude or position on something, especially and in spite of good argument or reasons to do so. So there's a difference. As adjectives, the difference between stubborn and persistent is that stubborn is refusing to move or to change one's opinion, firmly resisting, while persistent is tenaciously refusing to give up or let go. I believe we should all avoid being stubborn and strive instead to be persistent. Persistent gets us over hurdles, through tough times, past confusion, and further down the road to success precisely because you're willing, <laughs> you're willing, my time's up, okay, we're done. <laughs> um, so down success 
further down the road to success precisely because you're willing to do anything to get to that point. Learn, bend, listen, being open for any new information that will get you to that goal. Stubbornness just gets us into trouble with pig-headed inability to hear, listen, or change in any way. And worse, you have no intention of listening to outside counsel, even if that outside counsel is God. <clears throat> Persistence is a matter of the heart. Stubbornness stems from pride. It is an unwillingness to yield to wisdom. Stubbornness is, I am right and you are wrong. It's all about the motives. Persistence is motivated by faith, and stubbornness is motivated by selfishness. Persistence is willing to correct course. It is open to wisdom. It is not as concerned about how we get to where we are going, as long as we get to where we are going. Stubbornness is focused on, well, we're doing it my way, and even if that means we're not going to reach the destination we planned on, we did it my way. Persistence is focused on results. Stubbornness is focused on the method to do it. Persistence says, let's figure this out, and stubbornness says, yeah, my way. Persistence pursues wisdom. It values dialogue and is open to new ideas. Stubbornness is closed off to suggestions. Stubbornness fails to value the input and wisdom of others. <clears throat> Persistent looks to God for help. Stubbornness says, I've got this. I don't need any help, which is so obnoxious. It's really hard to ask for help. <laughs> Just think of it this way. In Proverbs 27, 17, that's the one about iron sharpening iron. Is the iron stubborn or persistent in that verse? Are you willing to be sharpened? Okay, so I've laid the groundwork. I don't want to be stubborn. I want to be persistent. I want to be tenacious and relentless and unshakable in my faith. I want to be tenacious, like the Canaanite mother. I'm going to take a drink of water. <laughs> okay. I want to be tenacious, like the Canaanite mother who begged Jesus for help in Matthew 15, 21 through 28. Initially, he refused her. Yet she continued pleading for her daughter, even after the disciples urged her to be sent away. Finally, Jesus answered, Woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed in that very hour. Her tenacious, persistent faith turned Christ's heart towards her and her kid, granting that the woman, granting that the woman, mm, granting what the woman requested. I want to be... Um, relentless. Did I do that? I want to be relentless. The parable of the persistent widow found in Luke 18, 1 through 5, illustrates how our relentless determination can get us what we desire. <clears throat> it reads, Jesus told his disciples a story to show that they should always pray and never give up. There was a judge in a certain city, he said, who neither feared God nor cared about people. A widow of that same city came to him repeatedly saying, give me justice in this dispute with my enemy, repeatedly. The judge ignored her for a while, but finally he said to himself, I do not fear God or care about people, but this woman is driving me crazy. I am going to see that she gets justice because she is wearing me out with her constant requests. She was relentless, even as Everything stood against her. She never gave up hope. Ugh. Okay, I want to be unshakable. In 1 Samuel 1, 11, 17, Samuel's mother, Hannah, probably would not have guessed that she would bear a child, let alone a prophet. The despair she felt because of her barrenness could have crippled her faith, but she continued to pray for years for her miracle. This is an un measurable there is an unmeasurable value in persistence those who stay persistent in their faith no wait i'm still here 
Without persistence, you do not have faith. Those who stay persistent in their faith will be persistent enough to persevere, but those who lose faith won't. They will, they will turn back, hold to their own counsel, and harden their hearts against God. It's faith that builds persistence, and persistence that builds faith. God is still God no matter what your life looks like. If we allow the situations in our own lives to dictate our relationship with him, then we are doomed from the get-go. Because he's not looking for wishy-washy faith. What gets his attention is our tenacious pit bull kind of faith. Hold on to your faith with such a tenacity that you are unshakable when it comes to following him. Relentless in seeking his guidance and stubbornly persistent in asking for his mercy to fill your life or grace, that you can fill in grace there too. One of God's most important factors in successful faith is persistence, not stubbornness. If you want to succeed in anything, you need persistence. If you want a solid marriage, persistence is a vital ingredient. If you have a goal in mind, then persistence will get you there. If your spiritual life starts to lag, then persistence will pull it back up. So this next part addresses the effort that this takes. The way to turn stubbornness into persistence is to be undivided in our relationship with God. A divided heart causes us to be inconsistent and untrustworthy. There's a quote from the Bible. James 1.8 says, their loyalty is divided between God and the world and they're unstable in everything they do. Thessalonians is a great place to look for guidance when it comes to persistence. Um, you can just read all of Thessalonians after today and, and catch all that. That's, um, uh, they were persistent. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 to 19, it says, Be unceasing and persistent in prayer. In every situation, no matter the circumstance, be thankful and continually give thanks to God. For this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench, subdue, or be unresponsive to the work and guidance of the Holy Spirit. The Thessalonians never backed down from the message in an attempt to soften the blow. They didn't back down to win friends for Christ. They didn't smooth over the hard to swallow parts of the gospel. Their faith was growing and flourishing while faithfully showing God's presence and power. Despite all the hardships and persecution thrown at them, they persisted. Um, one commentary that I came across wrapped it up really nicely, so I'm gonna use his words. It seems to me that the Thessalonians' faith in God's accomplished, it seems to me that the Thessalonians' faith in God accomplished several changes in them, not the least of which was their God-inspired ability to persevere. Their faith in God led to their holding up, not folding up. In 1.4, Paul praises them for their perseverance, in spite of the difficulties and obstacles. By faith, they secured a lifeline with God, and from him received spiritual supply, internal armament, emotional focus, and an unshakable eternal perspective. Theirs was not an inoperative, lifeless faith, as if such a faith was really worth the name, but a living, vibrant, strength-producing kind of faith rooted in sure hope. So dive into his word. Find its promises, its commands, its warnings, and its examples. Turn your heart to his purpose and find out how to live in a way to honor him. <clears throat> Ask God to show you what those opportunities are. Join in with others who are seeking God and encourage each other daily. Then you shall have spiritual strength and persistent determination we see in the Thessalonians. In Psalms 16.10, David said, I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Oh, I'm not there. Um, and in Ephesians 6.18, it says, Pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. 
Being aware of God's will and aligning your path to follow his is the most straightforward, positive use of persistent stubbornness. And I can leave it there today, but I also wanted to point out the flip side of this topic from God's perspective. I'm not going to start a whole nother sermon. It's only a paragraph. God didn't make us stubborn. He made us tenaciously persistent. And if we patterned off of him, if we are patterned off of him, we are, then you better believe he is doubly persistent, which brings us to God's persistent pursuit of you. So in Psalms 139, you will see that before you, you even thought about God, he was pursuing you. After all, in Psalms 139, 1 through 6, it reminds us that God's love isn't discri- is indiscriminate, it's intimate. He doesn't just enfold our hearts, he explores them. He doesn't just know our deeds, he understands our depths. It says, O oh, eternal one, you have explored my heart and know exactly who I am. And... It is the most amazing feeling to realize how deeply God knows me inside and out. I truly cannot begin to comprehend it. So that's it. So that's that that last little bit. I didn't get into it more than that. You guys can think on it. So I'm going to pray. Thank you, God, so much for addressing... for adding persistence to our mix. Thank you for relentlessly, tenaciously pursuing us and giving us the drive to follow your lead. Thank you for the joy of having a church family, and I ask that you be with each of us as we go through our week and guide our actions to better serve and seek you this week. In Jesus' name, amen.